God didn't make Abraham and the true followers of Abraham successful. For surely thou art praised and magnified. And O oh Allah, bless Muhammad and bless the true followers of Muhammad as thou did bless Abraham and the true followers of Abraham. For surely thou art praised and magnified. I mean. You may be seated. <clears throat> In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the most merciful, we give praise and thanks to Allah for his coming and appearing to us in the personage of Master W. Bard Muhammad. And we're eternally grateful to him for giving to us his wise choice in a messenger Messiah in the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And to the two of them, if we lived a thousand years, we can never thank them for the man that walked among us today. He is our shining example, our leader, teacher, guide, and friend in the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. It is in their names, dear family, I greet you again with the greeting words of peace. As-salamu alaykum. And welcome. How are we this morning, family? And if I could borrow from my, my brother, Shaheed, the math doctor, how you thinking? Come on. All praise is due to Allah. Thank you all for being here on time in the seats as you follow the instructions to the letter. Thank you for submitting to the check procedure. Well, we live in a very diverse time. We already know that we are in a war. And in a war, you can let nothing slip because all general orders are in effect. Right. So we check at the door. We check everything that comes in. We check your person. We check your pockets. We check your spirit just to see if you are ready to come in and hear this life-giving teaching. And why do we do it? Because sometimes when truth is given across this rostrum, and if we have a carnal mind and we have carnal weapons among us, we don't respond with the greatest of, in with the, of intelligence. We will respond carnally. So we remove anything that's on our person that may cause you know, one to not respond to truth intelligently because we don't want them, anybody to come in and hurt any of you and certainly anyone who has that idea in their head, we don't want to hurt them. So I'm going to go both ways. I mean, so that's why we remove, we level the playing field. So it's not like you're going to have any edge up in here. Everybody in here, throw down. I'm going to say it again. Everybody in here, throw down. All praise is due to Allah. So dear family, I just want to just really, I'm always elated. I'm always full of spirit and joy when I come before you. Not because I want to be a front, but because it is such a joy to just bear witness to the life-giving teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, as represented by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And before I move any further, let us all give a salute and a shout out and a big hand round of applause for our MGT GCC uh, to yesterday's work. We want to thank our sister student captain, uh, Kamisha Muhammad, for her leadership and leading the sisters to have, we had a wonderful dinner sale yesterday. We're going to tweak it. We're going to be real sharp down the road, but it was wonderful yesterday with what we had to work with. So thank you, sisters. Salute to you all by the grace of Allah. And, you know, um, I was telling Sister Captain, I was just looking at how the sisters were moving, you know. I could see that, you know, some were tired because they had been there for a minute, but they never left their post. That's right. They stayed the course. And that's what we are taught, you know, <laughs> to quit your post only when properly relieved. So, sisters, y'all did a wonderful work. And let me just move on just real quick. Thank you again. We, um, this is the war of Armageddon. The Honorable Louis Varacon told us at Savior's Day that the War of Armageddon has begun. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to put on the full armor. Is that correct? That's right, sir. The full armor of God. Because as Brother Rodney has been leaning towards it, he talked about a word called wiles. The wiles of Satan. That's right. What does that mean? How many of us remember, I mean, a lot of us watched cartoons when we were children. Come on now. Don't raise your hand, but you know, you watch cartoons. You remember the Road Runner? Remember, he was always had this character after him called Wiley Coyote. Well, symbolically, these are the people that are after us. They're doing the same thing. And Wiley Coyote was always setting up traps for the Road Runner. They always backfired, but they, he set them up anyway. So when we look at that, Someone who, who has, has the wiles within them, that's somebody who is always trying to set up a snare or a trap for you. What does that look like in a modern context? Let's look at social media. Could that be a snare or a trap Absolutely. for believers? I mean, if we get on and we're not imparting the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as represented by the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, and we're just getting into casual gossip, 
we can be pulled into the vortex, vortex of this world and we can lose our own divinity. No, no, no. We have divinity. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in here. That's right. That's right. I always think of a song. I remember James Brown had a song one time. He said, I know you got soul. If you didn't, you wouldn't be in here. Huh? So you got soul. You got spirit. You got what it takes that Allah can use us to be what Master Fard Muhammad made of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. What the Honorable Elijah Muhammad made of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And if we allow the Honorable Louis Farrakhan to do the same to us, we can be just as great. Maybe not, not, not in that, that this different uh, dispensation, but we can be great in our own little sphere, right? That's right? We may not have the light that the Honorable Louis Farrakhan has, right? You know, he told us one time, he said, you know, the white man make white light bulbs. Yeah, some light bulbs, 40 watt, 60 watt got a hundred watts he said but he makes some bulbs that are a thousand watts in other words if all we got is 60 watts don't be mad that you can't handle a thousand watts because that'll blow you out right but just be glad you got some light that's the point be glad you got light so if you got this teaching and we have all the tools that are needed to make our light shine brighter how about us just recharging every chance we get let's go to our lessons let's read the books let's look at the lectures now we're coming up on Ramadan next week. I, I know I need it. I know I need it. This is, I mean, it's for spiritual development. People say, well, y'all going on a hunger fast. You can call it whatever you want. My spirit is hungry. My mind is hungry. I need that for me. And I know you need it for you. Because it's about what? Self-improvement. The basis for community development. And until we can self-improve, we're never going to be the people of God. We'll never be the example or follow, be able to follow the example that the Honorable Louis Farrakhan is laying before us. If we don't do some pr improvement on ourselves, right. we can't look at anybody else. Can't look, oh, sister so-and-so, she need to do the uh, brother so-and-so, he ain't, uh-uh. Let's look at the man and woman in the mirror. Right. That's where it's gonna start. And the minute we start there, then everything around us start to fall into place. Yes, it's a struggle. Yes, it's a fight. But some fights are therapeutic. I mean, you don't know what you, what, you, what you got until you've been in a real fight. You know what I mean? You can walk around thinking you got muscles, you got the flexibility, you can do this. I can kick over your head. I can put you in a lock. But when the real fight starts, that's where the test comes in. That's right. And right now we are in a spiritual fight for our very lives and our families and everybody that we say we love. It's going to be a struggle. So, dear family, um, I was reading in the final call in the depopulation uh, section, and it says something very interesting. Now, you know, the suicide rate is off the chain, right? Yes, sir. And, you know, they're always telling us, you know, they put this fear into the air, and people fall in line when they're, when they're afraid of things. They say that the suicide rate is, according to these doctors and these scientists, the suicide rate is up because they're, everybody who has committed suicide, when they did an autopsy of that person, they found that they were vitamin D3 deficient. Isn't that interesting? Yes, sir. And yet, in the protocol that we got from headquarters, we were told that we need to keep vitamin D3 in our system because of this COVID thing, right? Yes, sir. So, if you, you, know, if you go to a doctor and you go and they, they, first thing they ask you, uh, have you had any thoughts of suicide lately? That's right. And you know, you be like, Suicide? Well, no. But if they're asking the question, they already know where it's generated from because they've been given instructions to ask the question. Right, right. Because they're looking for a certain response from you. Say, well, yeah, yeah, I've been a little down lately. They ask me that. I tell them, I say, yeah, well, look, no more than normal. Not, I haven't had no thoughts of suicide, but I have been, you know, going through what I go through, the vicissitudes of life. Where is that art? Bear with me, y'all. Just give me a minute. Yes, sir. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Absolutely. I hate it when I do this. Anyway, I'll find it, and I'll bring it right back to you. But the thing is, is that they know that in the food and the water we drink are chemicals that can literally put us in a state of mind that can cause us to want to do harm, not just to others, but to ourselves. Now, a study was done 
some years ago by the FBI scientists, they said that everywhere that they looked, every time they found somebody who had um, done a violent crime, a murder, a rape, or anything like that, that they always found polluted water in their system. Well, what is polluted water? Well, y'all you, you, heard of 40s, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> You've heard of just uh, alcohol in general, right? That's polluted water. Right. So people are putting this stuff in and it's causing them to have a chemical imbalance. So if, you, if you've been imbalanced before you took that in, imagine if you add that kind of stuff into your system, you're already thinking wrong, that's going to push you all the way over. But listen to this. It says, suicide is the 12th leading cause of death in the U.S. 2023 study of U.S. veterans found those with vitamin D deficiency who were prescribed vitamin D had a 64% lower risk of suicide when compared to those who didn't take the supplement. This adds to the growing body of evidence that insufficiency or deficiency is linked to depression and other nutrients found to improve mental health include vitamins B6 and magnesium, consuming refined sugar, and high carbohydrate diet may also increase your risk of depression as sugar primarily derives chronic inflammation, which is linked to depression. A 2019 study demonstrated that avoiding sugar, soft drink, processed meat, and refined carbohydrates lowered levels of depression and anger. Ooh, we'll come back to that. Low levels of vitamin D also increase one's risk of all cause mortality by 25%, cancer mortality by 16%, and lung related illnesses by 96%. The data show that optimizing vitamin D, particularly vitamin D3, can help prevent COVID and lower your risk of severe symptoms. So go outdoors and get as much sun as you can. So next time we have a call out, you know, you know what we need to be doing, right? How, we need to get out there in the sun, do some walking. Yes. No, but see, no, uh, I, I can make light of it like that, but it's serious, family. Yes, sir. They're trying to kill us with fear. No, put on the mask. Did you know uh, that wearing a mask repeatedly and on a regular basis causes something called hypoxia? Hypoxia causes um, delusions, it causes confusion, and it can even cause death over long periods. So uh, has the War of Armageddon began? emphatically yes and the number one thing they're using now is fear and as Jesus used to say or we should call it Jerusalem Slim he said my people die from the lack of knowledge get the final call newspaper there's so much in here I just read this from the final call you can do it too just get one and go through it but listen to this family to show you the, the, the difficulty factor that is involved while we're in this war of Armageddon it, Surah 9, Ayat, let me see, here we are, Surah 9, Ayat 40, Ayat 42, now you know Surah 9 deals with the disbelievers, but listen to this, had it been a near gain and a short journey, they would certainly have followed thee, but the hard journey was too long for them, and they will swear by Allah, if we had been able, we would have gone forth with you. They caused their own souls to perish, and Allah knows that they are liars. So, dear family, the mere fact that you are here shows that we are all committed to this. We don't run from it. And it, uh, not like, like the, the, the reading says from the Quran, that if it was an easy, if this was an easy thing, everybody would be in here. That's right. But it's difficult. And every time we bring up the restricted law, you go, what, I can't do that? I can't do that? Oh, no, I'll see y'all later. And then they go on back out in the world. But that is the thing that's going to save each of our lives. And as the Honorable Louis Farrakhan shared with us that little pamphlet that he gave us in 2013, um, in that day, your righteousness will sustain you. So we got to be right. What do you mean right? God, I got to be right to myself. Because in the prayer, in the very opening, it said that I have surely been unjust to myself. So with that being said, dear family, I see our student regional is on deck. I'm not going to belabor the point any longer. I pray that you got something out of what was just said. And may Allah continue to bless us all.
with strength, love, and the light of understanding as we all, along with our families, walk through the valley of the shadow of death called Armageddon. So dear family, at this time, open up your hearts, open up your minds, and let's bring to this roster our student regional minister, Rodney Muhammad, with a loving and well-deserved round of applause. Hi, salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Uh, in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the One God to whom praise is due, the Lord of the worlds, we thank Allah for His coming, as it was prophesied that He would come, seeking that which was lost. We thank Him for coming to us in the person of Master Fahd Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. We. Um, we thank him so much for his servant, the exalted Christ, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And to the two of them, we are eternally indebted to them for their student, servant, and apostle, our leader, teacher, and guide today, a Messiah to us and to the world, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Please uh, allow me to extend to you as it is our privilege to do so, the greeting words of peace in the language and tongue of our fathers. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you all for being out. I too want to echo, uh, as uh, Brother Joseph brought up, to thank the MGT for our great effort yesterday and thank the FOI and all of you believers for doing uh, our best with certainly what we have to work with. If you study the history of the Muslims, those that Prophet Muhammad was blessed to bring out of the world and culture, that uh, the revelation that was upon him and the mission that came as a result of that um, put on him um, they work with what they had. When I read Robert Goldston's The Sword of the Prophet, um, the one thing that the armies against the Muslim had great trouble with was the swiftness with which the Muslims could reach their opponents and in the name of Allah defeat them. Many of the armies would travel with great military apparatus, and it would take them months sometimes uh, to get to their destination point for battle. But in the Sword of the Prophet, Robert Goldston points out the Muslims traveled with bow and arrows and swords. And um, it allowed their armies to move swiftly um, across the plains and territories to meet their opponents. And um, they were known as great and fierce warriors in that. But my point was they, they worked with what they had and the greatest of what they had was their faith in a God who is always uh, victorious and there's no failure in him. We thank, we thank all of us for the great effort. Um, we um, today uh, want to talk uh, in continuation of our review. And when I say review, I don't mean skim over the words of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan from Savior's Day. Um, Putting on the full armor, you know, when I watched the eight-hour documentary of Muhammad Ali and his journey, starting with his fighting in the Olympics, all the way to becoming heavyweight champion of the world and losing the title and uh, regaining the title, always before the fight, there was a conditioning to get ready for the fight. That's right. That's right. And 
Oftentimes that meant running and he would do things like chopping down large trees uh, with an ax. Um, he even shadow boxed underwater. Um, there were just many techniques that he had uh, to apply strain and punishment to the body. But all the while he was conditioning the body for the fight. What I heard Savior's Day was um, our general telling us now to condition ourselves for the fight. The, the level of warfare is not so much a boxing ring where you're fighting physically. Um, this, is a, this is at the highest level of warfare that any people could ever engage. It's spiritual warfare. And the scripture says that our weapons are not carnal, but they are spiritual. And they are mighty unto God for the pulling down of strongholds. I heard him talk about a stranglehold that the synagogue of Satan has on government and world powers today. Well, that's a stronghold. And you can't get away from a stronghold unless the force that is with you is stronger than the force that's holding you down. So he's talking about being delivered from a stronghold. And um, part of what keeps you from getting caught up, and we're going to talk a little about this, because when you're at this high level, you know, you could be strong in the body, but weak in the mind. And when you're, when you're weak in the mind, the mischief right. of the synagogue of Satan could catch you. But if you're conditioned, just look at the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation, not, it doesn't represent you getting the knowledge. The helmet is there so you can keep it. You know, they can cause you to lose the knowledge. That's what a savage is. A savage is not a person that never had knowledge. They had it and lost it. We should be concerned, how does a person lose something once they got their hands on it? We're, we should be witness so far in North America that just knowing the honorable Elijah Muhammad and knowing his teaching was not enough. You can get it, but can you keep it? You can, you can get the wake up message and it can wake you up, but can you stay awake? Or do we fall back to sleep? Even the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the first of those raised from the dead. We were dead morally. We were dead spiritually. We bear witness to that. And we were, we were dead to the knowledge of the things that would give us a moral and spiritual life. Those kinds of things. So we had to get that first. So God came to give us that. And once the Honorable Elijah Muhammad became his 100% convert. Once he had life, he gave us life. That's right. That's right. The press asked him, Mr. Muhammad, what is your mission? He said, my mission is to give life to the dead. That means that the word that he preached to us had life in it. And for those that accepted his word, we begin to come alive as a result of that word. So we have to bear witness that a nation of us had the knowledge, yes, but we did not keep the knowledge. And where we were awakened from a 400 year sleep, we went back to sleep. So now somebody had to wake up again. Are you following now? If everybody's sleep, nobody's in a position to wake nobody else up. But if somebody wakes up, we got a chance to get up, wise up. So Farrakhan is the first from those that slept. Somebody had to wake up again. And he was faithful enough to stay awake. And once he stayed awake, that's why we're awake today. We're not here because of our faith. We're here because of the faith of one man, Louis Farrakhan. I am inspired by him. If I lose sight of him, I go back to sleep. 
So the synagogue of Satan is busy. Well, why are you with him, Rodney? He teaches hate. Hate is an emotion. You can't teach an emotion. Huh? He said you can teach, and whatever you teach is either truth or falsehood. Then the emotion follows it. Somebody can teach you something, and it can cause you to hate, but if the question is not whether you hate or not, the question is, what caused you to hate? Is it truth or false? Some people hate him, as Jesus said, without a cause. Somebody lied to you and you believed the lie, right? And then it brought an emotion out of you. Nobody taught you the emotion. The emotion comes out of you as a result of somebody teaching you whether it's truth or falsehood. The truth is that if Farrakhan taught hate, we'd be haters today. Huh? That would be the emotion that comes up out of us. Now, you can bring something out of us that'll bring a reaction like hate. As I heard him say, they threatened to kill his wife and children. He said, we born to die. He, he said, look, I'll come back from the grave and put my foot in your behind, talking about killing my wife and my children. And I said, make room for my foot because we should love him enough to want to come back from the grave, damn it, if anybody wants to kill him, Mother Khadija and the Farrakhan family. You sound extreme. You can't be casual and be a Muslim. Go ahead. Go ahead. Amen. Somebody trying to put you back in your grave, you better not be casual about that. It's going to take an extreme effort to hold on to your faith today. So he said, let's condition ourselves and put on the whole armor of God. Today's subject is really the ultimate challenge. Can the black world survive Armageddon? The first word we want to take up is ultimate, which means it's a final or fundamental fact or principle. Ultimate means either being or happening at the end of a process, something that's final. When you want to find in Roger's thesaurus uh, words that are synonymous with ultimate, supreme is one of them. Ultimate what, Brother Rodney? The ultimate challenge. A challenge is an objection as to the truth of something. A challenge not only is a duel, somebody saying, I challenge you. And then they go and put their guns up and duel. But a challenge is also a demand for proof. They call Farrakhan, an anti-Semite, he said, if I had you before me, I'd make you prove it. Right. Right. We are from an ancient people. Yes, right. And we really predate Semites, but we are the Semitic people. Right. It comes from Northern Africa and Arabia, and the honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that the original Hebrews and the original Arabs were black people. The earth, like some neighborhoods in Philadelphia that were once populated with black people, but after gentrification, there's been a depopulation and a repopulation of another people. Then someone goes there where they've repopulated and say, these are 
the original inhabitants, but they're not the original inhabitants. Are you following now? So you can go to Arabia now and see white-skinned people over the darker people, but that's not how we started. So the ultimate challenge is not about just victory, but survival. You on a flight with 250 passengers. The plane crashes and 249 people die and you live. You don't say I was victorious. You say, I thank God what? I survived. What's coming? Called Armageddon is so devastating, nobody going to be claiming victory. The Holy Quran doesn't end talking about a great victory and celebration. It ends with two surahs called surahs of refuge. You ever seen a refugee? A refugee is usually someone who's lost all their worldly possessions. They've even lost the place that they live. A refugee is somebody that ends up just being glad that they got out of it with their life. That's how we're going to come out of this world going down a narrow escape. Because the most important thing you can have in the time of Armageddon, the most important thing is guidance. We're looking for money and resources. Right now, we need guidance. If we had availed ourselves to guidance days before, we'd have resources. Black people spend every 365 days $1.3 trillion. We have a galaxy of leaders. But because leadership is scattered and divided, the people are scattered and divided. And because the people are scattered and divided, our money is scattered and divided. But had there been proper leadership availing themselves to the best possible guidance, no matter what our platform, no matter what our philosophy, no matter, we would see that we are black people and suffering and that every thing and everyone that can help us to come out of that condition into a better condition should have brought us together. Right. Chinatown is hosted with Chinese people, Japanese people, Korean people, Vietnamese people, we probably would go down there and couldn't tell the difference. But with, with this, this stadium coming, right, right, right. the, the difference, difference that the, the Korean had with the Vietnamese, Vietnamese come on. And, the, and the difference of the Vietnamese between the Japanese and the difference with all of them against the Chinese, they're all together as one community. They'll go back maybe to their differences but they said, when it comes to this stadium, taking away our business, right. our livelihood, our culture, right. which brings a menace on all of us, we agreed to be together and stand. So black people, by us being scattered, we're just fighting for a job. I've sat at dinners with the CDC of Chinatown, and in these dinners, their business people come up, and they say within that little square block area that we call Chinatown in Philadelphia, they have created 7,500 jobs. We're sitting here with North Philly, South Philly, West and Southwest, Northwest, and everything, and we're looking for a job. 
and we're looking for someone else to give us the job. In fact, to the point where we're demanding that they give us a job. With no demand on ourselves to create one. And we're scattered. That's, that's the point. So look what Allah does. In the last days, he brings about the war of Armageddon. When it was broken apart, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan taught us years ago, Armageddon is the armies gathered together for the doom. We may not know this, but in theology, Western civilization is the only religion that talks about a doom coming. When you go into Eastern cultures and their um, theologies and philosophies, they, they don't even have a concept of the world coming to an end. You don't, you don't find doom and those kinds of things and total global ruin until you get to Western religions. So what is it about the Western world, primarily the Caucasian people, that the way they see religion, because uh, they don't talk about Armageddon on MSNBC. They don't talk about it on CNN. You can even go to the military channel, and they're not talking about Armageddon. But it's mentioned in the scriptures as a war that was already scheduled to come. And now we know from the mouth of the Messiah that it's a war that has to take place because it's not dealing with who will be over this country or that country. It's dealing with who's going to live on this planet and who's not going to live on this planet. And the words of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that if we don't come out of her, my children, and be not partaker of her sins and plagues, then you and I would be scheduled to go down with them. Can we survive this great war that we find in the scriptures? Allah says in prophecy that uh, yea, will I gather them all down in the valley of Jehoshaphat. There, God would plead for his own people. And when you look at uh, Megiddo from the Hebrew um, expression, this area of the earth where this valley is, Megiddo, you can't get all the armies that are on the globe to fit in that geographic location. So the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us this valley of Jehoshaphat is the entire planet. We can already see that it's hard for two countries to be fighting each other and everybody else just stay out of it. You ever seen a fight after school? And two people said, oh, I'm gonna meet you after school. And while they fighting, everybody's around watching the fight and that's how everybody went home. Yeah, there was a fight today over at the school. But you know, you just watched it. You didn't get in it. And if anybody else jumped in it, generally it was the immediate family of one of the people that was fighting. Right? Yes, right, 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 right? Then gangs start forming. So you can't hit one of mine without hitting all of us. So we get in it. So, well, you ain't hitting my boy. So now it's a gang fight. Right? You kill one of mine, we're going to retaliate. We come back to kill one of yours. Now the, the scale of the violence has increased. It's gone beyond two individuals. 
So it's hard on the planet because they're gang banging on a, on a global level. You can't just go and fight the Ukraine. Mm. And the Ukraine fight Russia and everybody else stay out of it. They're trying to act like they stand out of it, but somebody slides a gun over here. Here, you can have one. I ain't gonna say nothing, you can take these leopard tanks. You need a missile or two. So three billion American tax dollars has already gone over there. But we ain't in it. And Russia knows that it's gone in there. And so you have some countries that say, well, look, I had a good deal going with Russia. Well, there's oil, man, because you all are fighting. I can't stop this because then we'd be short on our end. So China's still dealing with them. India's still dealing with them. Well, now you mad at them because they seem to be on his side. But they said, no, we're just trying to get our oil and other resources. We're trying to stay out of it. Now, tensions are rising. Because somebody, somebody, um, did it go out? Yeah. Somebody uh, ends up, you know, I think it's, okay. So, just so you understand that it starts out one way, but then it escalates into something far greater than what it was. So the words of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad were that the war will start out conventional. This is where everybody still feels safe. They bomb in there, but they didn't bomb us. So I, you know, I just watch it on CNN. But he said it will fast escalate into a nuclear warfare. And because of that, um, Europe will become a graveyard. Just, just try this on for a minute. You don't, people don't think it's getting ready to explode into something that great. But this has already been predicted. As the ministers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad sat down with him in the year 1967, they wrote the notes down as he told them how this world was coming to an end. That's right. That's right. It has to come to an end because somebody doesn't belong on the earth. What we know now, uh, and we're learning from every corner of black expression and learning, is that we're as old as the earth. We come with the earth. We're in harmony with the earth. And, and now that we're learning about ourselves, we're learning even that our names relate to the attributes of the divine being. But the people that rule over us, they don't name themselves after the creator or his characteristics. And that you can't find one of them that have named themselves or their children after the God. These are the people that taught us about God. But they don't want to wear his name. They named themselves after what God created. So I won't name myself Rahim. I'm Mr. Waters. I won't name my son Kareem. I name him, you know, Roundtree. Mr. Fisher. And this is not to make fun of them, but you should understand that as we're waking up, Satan talks to God. He says, respite me to the day they are raised. He didn't say how we were going to look when we got raised. But you can tell something is happening in America. Just look at the names of the actors and the different people that are coming on programs giving us the news and that they're, they're, they're slowly going away from the way that our oppressors used to train us to name ourselves and our children. Some of us are taking the names and experimenting with them. We don't even know what it means. So we got Shaniqua and 
we, you know, we're twisting it around. But when you go into the root of these names, etymologically speaking, you find it rooted in the language of the original people. Yeah, we're coming up. And this can't stop. So I wanted to get to a slide. I don't know what happened. I can't get to it here. But you got something up there on the screen, right? Yes, sir. What did it do? Did it go out? Okay. Well, either way, um, no, it doesn't, it's not giving me anything to, to come log in yet. Okay. I think it's coming up now. Okay, great. So, so family, you know, what the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is sharing with us, they don't have truth on their side. And when you don't have truth on your side, the, the one thing you don't do, you don't dispute the argument that the man is coming with. You dispute the man and try to color him in a way to give people a way to look at him so they won't listen to the argument. A lot of people don't know how this started. Well, why is Farrakhan fighting the Jews? He wasn't even bothered with them. Right. Right. I was standing on the stage at the corner of the stage 1984 Savior's Day. We were at the armory. Right. And Reverend Jackson was there and the minister was appealing to members of the Jewish community. Look, we can stand to lose an election. But we didn't want nothing to happen to Reverend Jackson or his family. Some of you might not have been in the nation. And even those that were in the nation weren't in Chicago to know how they cut up dead animals and threw on the porch. Nigga, this is what we'll do to you. We don't know how they threaten his daughter, Santita, who does radio shows and things there now uh, in Chicago when she was going to college there over in the east. We don't know how 100 white men were in jail because they threatened to do harm to Reverend Jackson because he was running for president of the United States. Even the Jews that took a, a full page ad out in the New York Times, Jews Against Jesse, 16 Jewish organizations denounced those Jews. In other words, you don't represent all of us. They bombed Reverend Jackson's one of his campaign offices. They threatened the Jewish Defense League with Meyer Kahani over it. They threatened to do harm to him and those with him. And the Negro mindset don't train you to fight them back. The Negro mindset you know, you're a managed social product of their control. And they had a stranglehold on your resources and your ability to keep your organization up. So they threatened uh, their organization and anybody that would help Reverend Jackson. There were black groups, leaders that were coming out against Reverend Jackson because of his appeal with the Palestinians and that, and he was running for president and they really wanted to flog him publicly and try to teach him a lesson. So it was the Honorable Louis Farrakhan who just appealed to him, let's dialogue, come on, come on. let's talk. Even if we run Reverend Jackson and he loses the election, we can stand the loss of an election. Come on. But what he was reading in black America about the hope of a black man mounting a significant run for that office, what he was reading from black America, they wouldn't tolerate something happening to Reverend Jackson. That's right. That's right. He said, man, they're saying, if you harm this brother, it'll be the last one you harm. Go ahead. Go ahead. So they were, they were angry at Farrakhan. So rather than saying, we'll answer your call for civilized dialogue, they called him a black Hitler. A statement 
from uh, Nathaniel Pullmutter of the ADL. It was designed to plant in some Jewish person, let me get up and do something to Farrakhan. So they threatened to do that. And, you know, they don't know. They didn't know who he was. The articles were saying, who's Farrakhan? Who's to blame for Farrakhan? Nobody really knew him. So they were, the press was trying to figure out, and they controlled the press. They were trying to figure out, you know, really, who is he? Well, we're going to go get him. And we got on 79th Street and said, come on with it. They found out who Farrakhan was that day. And we waited on every last one of them to come up because nobody had to figure out who the hell they were. And we said, we're not running. We'll be right here at 79th Street. We were in the final call building then. The minister began to travel to help Reverend Jackson uh, in, his, in his bid uh, to do that. So this is a war like people. And what we learn from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is that um, Allah uses what is already with you as his weapon. And what is with us is the creation. And, and, you know, he, he constructed the universe on divine law. And at the root of all that is truth. And at the root of that truth is Allah himself because he's the author of truth. So once you are against the truth, and he says Armageddon has already started, he said it started the day that truth clashed with falsehood. So if you've built your world out of falsehood and false teaching, then the truth is clashing with your civilization. I had some statistics here to show what the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan was, um, was doing. I think the connections are good. It could be. I really want to show you this, you know, what we have here, huh? No, it didn't come up. Yeah, so anyway, if it comes up, uh, inshallah, I'll get a chance to show it to you. But they're warlike people. And when you, when you talk about a day to determine who's gonna live on this planet, well, that has to be a pretty powerful person to have come uh, to bring about such a thing. You know, somebody said, well, Farrakhan is out threatening people. The prophets threaten people. Come on, come on. That's right. Huh? Yes, sir. You know, when you bring your truth and you're willing to stand on it, the people who have been successful capturing the people in falsehood, they say, bring on that which you threaten us with. Right. They take it as a threat, right. according to the language we get from the scripture. So um, Armageddon uh, is about to, you know, get into another phase. And this phase will be so tremendous because this man is not going out peacefully. He's used to ruling us. He wants to rule you. You think we just suffering from a misunderstanding. Hopefully, hopefully we got this thing fixed, huh? I can't see it. I can't see anything. So maybe it's the battery. I don't know. But, uh, okay. Okay. Well, anyway. Don't turn it off, okay? Okay, I think we're there. Yeah, we're here now. All right, good. Praise be to Allah. Thank you. So, um, 
So let's follow with it. Let's, let's first look at what this man is doing. He's a warlike military people. They just, they just start talking about not letting these generals determine what they're getting ready to do. Right now, there are from 750 to 1,077 military bases around the globe. That's somebody that intends to fight. And that's somebody who, if they fought already and won the fight, they intend to hold the territory. You can't have that many bases around the world and not be in somebody else's country. So you're actually in someone else's sovereign space telling them how much they can do. And if they exceed any limit that you have set, you got the guns already there. Are you listening to that? Where you get the kind of money to do all that? Hell, he took our money. When you work and you see that thing come out, they don't ask you. Since 1913, that means all the way up through 1912, the way the government got their money was through trade and commerce. After 1913, somebody went and set up a central bank and said, we're going to start taxing the average citizen. I, I never understood that. And uh, growing up, when you look at the comics in the Sunday papers, there was a character, a hillbilly named Snuffy Smith. And he was always get his rifle when the revenue man came. So I just, you know, but I didn't pay a lot of attention to that. But it's the Internal Revenue Service. And they were coming up to tax him and he said, you know, I'm used to not paying no taxes. And Snuffy Smith would have his rifle going after these people because they were, they, they, they came up with a banking system now where not only do they tax us, but they pull the money out of thin air. Right. Nobody really knows how the monetary system works in America. Right. That's right. You know how the economic system works. You know how you know, uh, the social system works. You know how the political system works, but you can't explain how the monetary system works. And Jesus had patience for everybody, whether it was prostitutes, demon-possessed people, everything. But when it came to the money changes, he had no tolerance. Isn't that something? And I mean, he went after the, the money changes violently. Now, you know, they want us to think this is some people selling pigeons and vending at the temple. But let me tell you, this is people who change one form of currency from one country to another. And they control nations like that. And as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan pointed out, they, they caused the nation to go to war because that's where you really got to spend money. And once, once you have to spend money, you got to come to them to get the money. And when you go to the Federal Reserve, which is not a part of the American government, the Federal Reserve is separate from the government. You don't vote these people in, you don't vote them out. And, and, and America borrows the money. And when they borrow the money, they charge them interest. In the Quran, it's called usury. But we don't ask, who are you borrowing the money from? Then they tax us to what? pay back these people who are secret. A shadow government, as Brother Ishmael brought out so eloquently that the Honorable Louis Farrakhan has been sharing with us for years, there's a shadow government. They're in the shadows. You don't know these people. And they don't want that system to stop. So every president, interestingly enough, that tried not to go and borrow this money from them, but print money for ourselves here and use that money for circulation conveniently. These were the presidents that were assassinated. Lincoln came out with greenbacks, right? They tried to print their own money. And this is before 1913. They were fighting to get in here then and he was keeping them out. 
he conveniently gets killed at a theater. Then they get in in 1913 and they've been operating in John F. Kennedy who doesn't want to deal with this new thing that Eisenhower warned going out, the military industrial complex. Now they got to go borrow from the central bank to fight in Vietnam. So Kennedy was unsuccessful at trying to pull them out of Vietnam. They wanted the war because the weapons manufacturers needed the money. Huh? And they used the elected officials to be their advertising agents, peddling fear to the American people. And then they tell you, we want to keep Americans safe. If Americans were in trouble from these other countries, then the business people that were over there from America should have been the first ones that got killed. How come they never were had their lives threatened, but so, so far as we're concerned, we're in danger because of people like Saddam Hussein. We're in danger because of people like once they got the Shah of Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini, and they just keep naming people. And then they put that person up in front of you and they color them with lies and maybe a half truth. And then they inflame your emotion that comes after their presentation. Right, 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 right. That's why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the dragon is a mythical creature. There's no such thing as a flying lizard that spews fire out of his mouth. He said, that's the white man's satellite system. And through his satellite system, he can relay messages all over and feed you and I on the screen. And the flame is your own emotions. Here's a man smoking a weed. Come on, we, 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 you know, we got to do something about Saddam. What do you mean, we? You ain't at the table making no damn decisions. You're a managed product of a modern day Rome, Egypt, and Babylon. You don't run nothing except your mouth. This man got guns everywhere. We here with Jeff Brown talking about a gun buyback. That ain't stopping this. For every one tax dollar, 64 cent of that dollar goes toward military spending and war. So look what Allah has already done. Despite all these guns, all the conquering that's gone on, and America has reached out abroad, the, 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 the producing land is 29 million square miles. The question was asked, how much of it does the original man use? He uses 23 million square miles. I said, well, how much does the colored man use? Six million square miles. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, six million square miles is the geographical area of the United States of America. New York is the financial capital of the world. Washington, D.C. is the political capital of the world. But despite all the conquering, she's dying. Uh, according to Patrick Buchanan, this is one of the real alt-right conservatives. He ran for president before. Patrick Buchanan said, the West is dying. Its nations have ceased to reproduce. Look at this. And their populations have stopped growing and they have begun to shrink. He's gone over all the statistics of all the Western countries. He said, there are more burials than there are births. Their manufacturers are making more coffins than cradles because more of them are dying than white women having babies. They had to go after Roe v. Wave. 
There, there are nearly 40 million or more abortions that, that have taken place in the United States of America since abortions were allowed. So they, they, they're telling the white woman now, you're going to have a baby. Whether it was rape, whether it was incest, we don't care how you, we need a body and a heartbeat. That's white because we're, we're not, everybody is outnumbering us. And Patrick Buchanan said, even if the darker people in America were growing in numbers over white, we had them under a certain model. But they're not just growing in numbers, they're growing in consciousness. So the, 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 the profile, the, the, the profile here in America is changing drastically. Some are saying these immigrants coming from Mexico. Now, when consciousness comes, they say, no, we're not immigrants coming into your country. We're coming back home because you were the immigrants. We had Texas. We had Arizona. We had California. That was our country till you came and ran us out. That's why you got to learn today. So Patrick Buchanan wrote a book, The Death of the West. And he's showing that their culture is dying. See, Allah is already working against us. The war of Armageddon has already started. The truth is starting to prevail. Look, when you, when, when, when somebody is hell bent on teaching you falsehood, all you have to fight with is the truth. If he will not keep and obey the law of Islam, then you have to hurl the truth at falsehood. So you knock out his brain. This is a predatory, predatory civilization that we're living in. And they're militarizing them. Um, and so you see the militias are coming up. Don't get caught up in, well, they got a little organization called QAnon and that. These are militias. Right out of the second amendment you have the right to bear arms and form militias and they're armed and they went up to the capitol and you know if that had been black folks busting through the windows and everything our bodies would have been sprawled all over washington dc There's an arrangement that they have. It's an unspoken agreement. We just won't kill white folks outright. That's why they let them bust all the way through, hurt officers. Then they, now you want to have the January 6th hearings to talk about how many white officers died as a result of that from the Capitol Police Force. But those officers didn't have to die. All they had to do was shoot these people and kill them. But how could they do that? Because that's one of their own. They could have done it if it was us. They could have done it if it was Muslims. Why? Because they've already ginned the people up mentally to want to see these folks dead. We um, have seen excessive force used by the police. But when the officers are white, and the victims are always black, never white. It takes days to get evidence, months to get evidence, sometimes years to get evidence on video footage and everything. But when five black officers get involved and do this in less than 20 days, the videos were out. By 30 days, everybody was, was fired, charged with murder, right? So now we know you can move swiftly. We don't have to drag this along. 
in court over years. See, this trial will be taking place fast. We got to wake up, man. We don't agree with just because you black, you get the right to do us like this. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote a book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And the Pegues were the slave masters of the slaves on that plantation where Uncle Tom was. But the menace to the people wasn't as much the white man that was beating the black folks. They had raised a little black baby up named Sambo. And Sambo in that book, he was the one that was used to beat his own people. We're looking at the Sambo syndrome. That once a black man gets a gun and a badge, somehow he's more inclined to kill one of his own than he is a white person. And when we first got on the police force, black people weren't allowed to arrest white people. When I go to talk to the new police cadets that are getting ready to hit the streets of Philadelphia, you know, going, doing this month after month and these new people are coming on, it ain't no sense holding our tongue. So I just tell them the truth. I don't have to say it in an ugly way because the Quran directs the Muslim call to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and a goodly exhortation and you can take your argument in the best manner. But even though it's in the best manner, it still needs to be the truth. I said, they're getting ready to give you a gun and a badge and set you loose on the city to find the criminal. I said, many of you will be planted in neighborhoods that are primarily populated with my people. You'll see stores already set up that they don't own when you get there. You'll see homes that are in a state of disrepair because the banks don't lend them money for home improvements. You'll see broken sidewalks and streets, but more you'll see broken minds and spirits of the inhabitants there. They're, they're at a dead end. And you'll be told, go in there and find the criminal. But what I have just described to you is the crime scene. The crime that already took place. But they've dumbed us down so. so Let's finish this. Uh, we, we can't finish this all today. But uh, suffice it to say that we're at the end of things now. That's why this is the ultimate challenge. Our, our, our challenge is, uh, do we really want to survive? Because they're against truth and truth is now clashing with their civilization, Allah has brought the truth on and he's using as his weaponry what he created out of truth. Look at the disasters between just 1980 and 2022. There have been 332 $1 billion disasters. That means each disaster cost this country at least a billion dollars. There's been 300, let's break them down. Since 1980 and 2022, there have been 160 storms. Each storm cost the taxpayer $1 billion. These are some hell of some storms that are coming. Sometime because the reports are scattered. You saw Channel 6, I saw Channel 10, somebody was on CNN, somebody was here. You know, we don't put it all together. But Allah is beating this country up. 
That's one year before our first Savior's Day in the rebuilding, 1980. 160 storms. There have been 57 hurricanes. There have been 36 floods. Do you realize a flood, what it tears up? As the honorable light, it tears up bridges and that. Floods are what he's getting ready to bring as mischief in what's called a propaganda campaign. Right, right. Not only against the minister, but going after the remnant, because they can't get the woman who's really representing a man. But they have to have the man symbolized as a woman, because until a man sees a woman properly, he can't see God. And this world's greatest crimes, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, have been against the woman. He said, it is the mistreatment, the messenger said, of the female that is the first act that sends God after them. 36 floods. So when the propaganda starts just like a flood, snakes can't stay hidden. Bridges can't stay up that connect one part with the other. The flood just tears up everything. 36 of these, and each one of these floods had cost America at least a billion dollars. There were 20 winter storms. See, the snow that was stored up in the north. The messengers say they have no defense against the snow. Well, we got some F-16s. You can't take off. When the snow is is high like that, you, the, the F-16 will just stay right there on the ground. Right. It can't do nothing but stay in neutral. That's right. It needs some place to take off. And then once you take off, the, with the snow up there coming down on, the, on your wings, freezing. See, you can't fight effectively with your weapons. Look at, it, uh, look at how Allah just, he turned the creation loose on you. And if we're with the Messiah, this is all to our advantage. Don't get mad. Damn, I've got all this snow. I got to get up and everything. Man, thank Allah he's sending it. He know what he's doing. I've seen hurricanes marching on the country. And you get to a black neighborhood, say left flank march, and they turn around, get away from black folk, come right back. Torna squads of tornadoes. That's our God working. All the above is caused by the Son of Man. Take it or let it alone. Look at him. 30 droughts. 30 droughts. And out of 30 droughts, each drought costs a minimum of a billion dollars. Now we've been living in food deserts. But here's a God. He can dry up the land. He can send a strong wind. And he can take land that wasn't fertile and make it fertile. He can take land that was fertile and dry it up. See. The, the universe was constructed on truth. You can't live in it comfortably as a liar. You can't build a civilization on falsehood and your civilization survive in a universe of truth. We are a cosmic people. There's something about us that goes beyond dollars and cents and goes beyond the material reality that we live in. 20 wildfires. Nobody went and said it. God said it. Just, just, just nine freezes. And, and notice the wildfires. I didn't even know folks lived up there during rich. 
I didn't know nobody lived up. You know, you look at the woods, you live, there ain't nobody living up there. They got driveways swing around and they live in part of the house. You can walk out on a tree and stuff. You know, they, I mean, they got it going on up there. Allah went after all that. I didn't know they lived up there. I know now. Huh? You didn't know they lived up there, did you? Freezes. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad promised nine freezes that cost at least a billion dollars each. That's nine billion dollars. And um, the, the messenger said, it's going to get so cold, it'll freeze your lungs just trying to breathe in that environment. You know, if somebody came to you, you want to go to the North Pole? We could spend a week up there. <laughs> Please. I'm, you go talk to somebody else about that. I'm not going to the North Pole. Too damn cold up there. Well, guess what? He'll bring that cold right down to your neighborhood. A neighborhood near you, that kind of cold can come. It, it, it could get so cold, they'll tell you, keep some water running because your pipes will bust. Now, you notice in these cities, the mains are busting now because all these old pipes. We got 48 miles of old pipes in Philadelphia. They need to get under the street and try to put something new. They're just busting all over the place. So the minister said, we haven't seen anything yet of what this God is bringing. Let's look at this. All of this, the cost exceeds $2.2 trillion. So a trillion dollars is a thousand billion. And a billion dollars is 10 hundred million. That's a lot of money. We spend 1.3 trillion dollars, just black folks. You know, we recklessly spending and everything. You know, we in Walmart, wherever we spending it. It come down to 1.3 trillion. But just think, that's a thousand billion. So if we take nine, if we take nine hundred ninety-nine billion dollars off the table, then we just got one billion left out of a thousand, right? So just 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 follow me now. So one billion is what ten hundred million. So it's forty, no more than fifty million black people in America. We got enough money for every single black person could have $2 million. I'm just talking about personally. It's in your pocket or purse, your, your account or whatever. And look how much money we got left. We done took $999 billion off the table. That's how much money we spending. And you think we're guided? Everywhere there's a complaint line, we in it. So, you know, so we need, we need some common sense. So anyway, um, 15,000 people have died, and it's, it's more than that now from this count that I'm coming up with today. Um, I want us to, to, to follow because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said the destiny of this country is doomed. And she's done it herself. Her greatest crime was bringing us here. That's... That's her greatest crime. We fulfill what happened to God's people who were in bondage for 400 years. And as we said before, we know we're those people because Europe wasn't in existence and the people from Europe who converted to Judaism, which I don't have no problem with somebody saying, look, I want to convert to something that that uh, conforms my life to what God revealed to Moses, if you truly want to live that way. The Holy Quran say those who are Jews or Christians or Sabaeans or whatever, whosoever does good. Is that what it says? Whosoever does good. They have their reward from their Lord and neither shall they fear nor grieve. So God ain't no respect of person. So don't, don't name drop on me. 
In other words, you can't say, I'm a Jew, and no matter what you do, God is with you. You can't say, I'm a Christian, and no matter what you do, God is with you. You can't say, I'm a Muslim, and no matter what you do, God is with you. I can't, because I'm a Muslim, say I can go blow up some other people. You don't have that nowhere in the Quran. Is that right? Whoever does good, they got their reward with their Lord. That's the religion. Who, who's willing to do good? Because religion ain't what you preach. It's what you practice. Huh? So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us. Well, what are the practices in this land? Because folks are getting angry. And our anger is turned in on each other. So there's not a night that goes by in any major city where black people haven't taken a shot at each other or killed one another. Our, our young people, in particular the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said they're locked up in a culture of death. And if that's the, if that's the culture, they don't see no wrong in it. Dr. King said, if people sit in darkness, they're bound to sin. And he said, though they sin, the guilt is not on the sinner, but the man that created the darkness. He said the darkness is created by policies made by white society. That's a major crime Dr. King saw. They created discrimination, they created poverty. So when we commit crimes out of the conditions that they force us in, he said those are crimes, but they're derivative crimes from a major crime. We're not asking you to go and do right by us and set up something that will produce something better out of us. We asking you to leave us alone. Just leave us alone. And we knew we, when we connect with our God, we know how to bring better out of ourselves. Well, you know, Muhammad, uh, we got to go to them because the school system's broken. And I said, well, what is it doing? Well, you know, black children are not learning as well as white children. I said, that's not broken. That's the way they designed it. You're the one that's broken. I'm the one that's broken out of it. And if we want to come out of a broken state, we're going to have to take education into our own hands. That's why you see on the back page of our newspaper, out of the 10 points of what we want, Mr. Muhammad calls on us to take charge of the post of educating our own. And that's not just for people in the temples that are under his leadership. That's for the black world. This, this is talking about the black world now. That's right. Our children, he said, if they are brought up in decency and righteousness, they're going to be superior to what you've been able to produce here. Well, um, you can see God is beating up the country that uh, the scripture says that they might humble themselves. So we, we seize them with great distress. Maybe they'll look because all of these things are acts of God. You can't blame Putin for the hurricane. You can't blame uh, Putin or China for wildfires and winter storms. Can you? Your insurance company, they'll turn around and won't pay you a claim. Because they say, well, you know, we're, we're exempt from acts of God. So if we bear witness, God is behind these particular acts that have come on the country, costing it in excess of $2.2 trillion, and God ain't finished yet. Maybe we need to appeal to that God. And I believe that out of white America, a lot of them would want to make that appeal. Their problem is they're so steeped in the racist thought now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They can't take God 
bringing salvation and a chance for them to come out of their misery because it's a black man that God is using as his voice. That's their problem. Their problem isn't Jesus. Their problem is Jesus being black. Their problem ain't Christ. They just don't want Christ to be black. Come on, Christ. They'd be like, give me a break. The messenger said, even the wicked want change. They just want to be in charge when the change take place. You know. Let's look at what these draconian policies and inequalities do. This is from the National Academy of Sciences. This is what we're living under, and we're trying to survive. Killed by police is the leading cause of death for young black men. So we're talking somewhere between 15 years of age and 29. The leading cause of death is not just being killed, being killed by police. Then one in every 1,000 of us will be killed. So you, you just see how many thousands you can get out of 40 something million people. Brother Nuri was here. He was showing that the birth rate of males exceeds the birth rate of black females. But by the time we get 25 years of age uh, or nearby there, it's far more black females than there is black males. Somehow we dying younger and younger. And he was proving his point that a predator is hunting his prey. Only people die at a rate like that and don't live to old age. They, they, uh, there's a predator on them. One in three black boys born since 2001 will spend time in prison. See, that's a design that they have ramped up. They, they know how to take their laws and tighten things up. They used to let black folk stand around. You can be merry and the fiddler would play and you know, the niggas are having a nice time and that kind of thing, till Nat Turner came. And you can read how when Nat Turner came uh, and they started uh, going plantation to plantation, killing the slave masters and freeing the slaves from those plantations, then they said, man, we got to do something. First thing is to catch Nat Turner. They finally caught him. And they killed him in one of the most horrible fashion. That was 1831. By 1832, they had to set up some laws that black folks ain't allowed to gather. So all that, that you taught us in the Bible, where two and three are gathered in his name, say, well, y'all won't be gathered by no two or three, lest we there. So now when we say, yeah, when two or three of us gather, not only is Jesus there, the FBI is there. The CIA is there. Somehow the government is making sure they're on the scene because they did not want us gathering. A lot of people don't know that the March on Washington in 1963, they were terrified. When A. Philip Randolph of the Pullman Porters called a march in, uh, for July of 1941, they were so afraid of having thousands of black folks come down to Washington to protest that Roosevelt came up with a, 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 an act this had to come straight from the White House. Um, what was it, 8802? It was Bill 8802. So when you're going to get a job, because we're not creating them, the big sign on the wall will say, you know, they can't discriminate against anybody for employment and that. That's Bill 8802. And that was supposed to calm the Negroes down. So A. Philip Randolph backed off of the march. But as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan keeps pointing out, we keep asking for jobs and justice, jobs and justice. So no jobs and then still great injustices. So by 1963, they said, we got to go back to Washington. And A. Philip Randolph knew how to organize people with Bayard Rustin, right? Dr. King had the voice, but he didn't know how to organize people 
for a march on that scale. So they all come together, the big six, and they go down. But what we don't realize, the white man had the military poised and ready because he was not ready for no gathering like that. I'm telling you the God's honest truth. And Dr. King, just like the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan went to speak for the memorial of that great march, the minister only had six seconds, but they told him, Farrakhan, you did in, in six minutes, I'm, I'm sorry, it was six minutes, they said, you did in six minutes what Dr. King did in 18 minutes there because they didn't want the minister on the microphone. And the minister said they were tugging at his coat, but he took that six minutes and lit that thing up. And, and what a lot of people don't know, what happened in 1963, they, um, they knew the press don't stay there all day. So they scheduled themselves to be there while the press was there. And they made Dr. King the last speaker. So that by the time King came on, most of the press had gotten the pictures and everything they wanted and they were gone. And Dr. King spoke for 18 minutes. And that 18 minutes, that March on Washington, that's the only speech we know about. We don't even know about the other speeches after Dr. King spoke for that 18 minutes, right? So, you know, you never know. They plan a plan, a law plan one. Yeah, look at this. One in four black children have a father in prison. One in four. Out of 230 black youth, one out of every 230 are detained right now in some juvenile center. In other words, we're being managed by the courts. Some people that are not in there, you only out because you got something on your ankle. So you, you, you have open air court control. And every other person says, come on, man, let's go down. Well, I can't go that far. I got to go. But, but, you know, it's like we watching one of them uh, future type of movies where they got something planted on you. And they know where you are at all times. Yeah, and we're trying to survive. This is according to the National Academy of Sciences. I mean, I don't have other, but this shows you the draconian type of laws that are being set on us. And they don't want us gathering. Look what they said in 1832 to make sure that we couldn't gather. First they said, we gotta figure out what was the difference between Nat Turner and the other slaves? They said the difference was we let Nat Turner learn how to read. And we had him read the Bible and teach it to the slaves. But we made sure we were standing there so he would teach it the way we wanted it. But somehow Nat Turner had an idea in his head that he didn't share with us when he was reading. And he didn't share with us when he was preaching. But the slave must have known about it. Because they got behind him. So the honorable Elijah Muhammad quoted Henry Berry in 1932. And he said, for all we know, we've cut off every avenue whereby light may enter the mind of the slave. And he went further to say, we've conditioned the slave in words so that even if light comes, He'll reject the light. We'll set it up so that when somebody tries to feed him light so he can come to consciousness, he'll actually fight against that man. That's why the honorable Elijah Muhammad was told by God, you got the hardest job of any man in the annals of history. Because when somebody comes with light after people have sat in darkness, that man should be gladly received. The contrast is so great. I'm in darkness. Here you come with light. Once the light comes, I can see what was in the darkness. They just think of that. And I'm fighting you and you trying to bring me light. That means somebody has to me. Yeah. Well, they well, won't they recondition you again because they know you waking up. And without the full armor, they'll be able to take you back in what you were in before Farrakhan started preaching to you. 
I know what baptism is like. I was baptized in a creek in Tennessee. They put you down in the water, bring you up in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in that muddy water down there in the rivers of Tennessee. I did not know that it would be, as a little boy, some 16 years later, that I would be baptized all over again. I'm sitting there at Martin Luther King High School listening to Louis Farrakhan. And I'm not going to real baptism because I'm not in the muddy waters now. I'm being immersed in the wisdom of the honor boy Elijah Muhammad. That is the real baptism. I want us to see, before we close, the pressure that's on us. Just look at these statistics. The pressure is on us. And you know, with the earth traveling 1,037 and 1,000 miles per hour, and the gravitational pull that comes as a result of its travel through space, it puts pressure, atmospheric pressure, on the human form. Physics says it's 14.7 pounds of atmospheric pressure for every square inch of the human body. For all practical purposes, we should be crushed as the earth is turning. But there's a counter force inside. That's why you have to breathe when you come out of the womb of your mothers because you're no longer protected. Breathing is the only thing that counters the pressure that's coming in now. There's 14.7 pounds of atmospheric pressure when we breathe inside, countering the 14.7 pounds outside. Are you following now? So when your mind don't have the breath of life in it and the pressures of life start coming, some of our minds are collapsing. Mental health is growing in the black community to a degree that like Jesus had to go deal with people who had just went absolutely berserk and demonic, this is beginning to happen to us now. And it's because of the pressure that we're living under. Look at these from the National Academy of Sciences. One in three black families have zero or negative wealth. That'll put some pressure on you. Damn, I'm walking around here with nothing. Don't nobody live comfortable under that. You know, and we still know how to go out and have a good time. We're crazy as hell, but we have a good time. And they're trying to, they scratching their head. How do they live like this? I got them living in a basement, and they go have a basement party. They ought to be on the street now, but they done had a rent party. And, but I just, I'm saying, when you're trying to survive, Huh? I know people go to these fancy clubs now. I see where people get shot in these fancy clubs, but it used to be the basement party. Yes, to, the, to, to this day, I still don't know how we all fitted in that basement. But we got down there, didn't we? Yeah. One in three, we got, we got zero or negative wealth. And even the homes that we have, we learn it right here in Philadelphia, our titles are entangled. And if we don't get it right and write a will in that, we, we don't pass on property. Just you being there, living there, and your mama was there and she's no longer with us, she transitioned, that don't automatically mean the house is yours. So the developers come in and you know, you don't find out till you get a letter or something. Huh? Well, the taxes are behind. Well, I, you know, uh, shoot, I've been just looking at the water that comes in every time it rains. I can't even get a roof put on because I got zero wealth. Yes, sir. I don't even have emergency fund. Yes, so I'm, I'm living trying to dodge the water yes, and you get ready to come take that from me. Yes, because you say, I'm not documented on this house. I'm just giving you an example of some of that that's going on. And, 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 and housing is, is one of the greatest assets 
to start wealth building for black America. It's not like we sitting around with stocks and bonds and owning gold mines and different things. So our wealth is generally the home. And they taken that from us. One in six black families can't pay utility bills. That may, you know, you know, not only is it troublesome, but it's humiliating when you go down there and try to get it straight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You have no privacy. Right. Your water's off. Right. Yes, ma'am. I'm just here. I'm trying to find out. I think there's been a mix up. My water was turned off. I'm trying to get it turned. Well, your water, you, you didn't pay the bill. Huh? If you pay the bill, your lights will be back on. So they, they strip you any dignity. Stress. You really want to reach across that counter. You got to hold it in. Security. Huh? Stress. Come on, somebody. This is our story. Look at it. One in every seven and a half black adults have to cut their meal sizes. You know, because you got, you, got, you got others in the house. Everybody can't eat like you used to eat now. Food insecurity shot straight up in 2020 when the COVID came. Now we're finding a whole lot of people can't come. So people used to come out every now and then with we need to feed the homeless and, you know, people that are without. This has become a regular thing now. The people that's giving out the food said, I need one of these boxes. <laughs> you got some good oranges in there. Huh? Food insecurity is growing. One in every 13 black adults can't afford medication. See, how to eat to live is really a health maintenance program. How to eat to live is really the study of preventive medicine that's already stored up in food. If you know the proper foods to eat, if you know the proper times to eat. Well, you know, after nine to five, I'm, I'm hungry. But your body don't move by the white man's nine to five. Your body moves by the sun. So the messenger teaches us if you just eat one meal and go 24 hours, you, your body is already designed to start killing the poisons in there. We come with the earth. We predate the sun. The sun gives everything its color. They've studied every, every spectrum of light that comes from the sun. Black is not in it. So how do you explain black if the sun don't give black? The only way to explain black is that we gave black the sun because we predated. So when the sun comes on us, we absorb all the colors. Every color that's on this planet came out of the black man and woman of the earth. That's why the Lord says, out of one blood came all men. Out of one blood. And why Brother Ishmael said, that's why black lives matter. Because the people that's killing black life, you got your start with black. Fasting, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, will kill uh, up to 90% of the things that are ailing us. Right. Just stop eating. Yes, sir. If, you, if you have any pets, you'll see if once they're sick, the first thing every animal does, they stop eating right. when they're sick. We get sick. Let me go get me some greens or something. <laughs> Don't. Just stop eating. 
cut me a piece of this cornbread and get me something. I, child, I need something to eat. I wasn't feeling well. But no, I mean, that's the way we've been raised. We don't, we don't know. That's why we need a teacher. This besides somebody, he tells you what foods to store up in your house. And of course, one in 13 of us, we can't afford to see a doctor. You know, we just put things off because it's a hassle, right? The first thing black folks will do is just, I got time to wrestle with these people and do you have this? Well, you need this one. Do you have a blue card or the purple one? Uh, you know, come on. Out of 2,060 black women, one out of every, just say 2,000, they die pregnant or at childbirth. And a third of black children live in poverty. At a time when social media is showing them, I don't even accept you unless you're wearing the latest. So what do you do if you're in poverty and you're addicted now, as Chris Rock said, to attention? I mean, that's the greatest addiction that we got out here today is attention. Did you know the suicide rate is up? If people do cyber bullying now and somebody talks about you, you know, the mind is so weak now because of the way that we have assessed ourselves. So, I, you know, I can't go on because, but I, I wanted to mention something of the Muslim world because sometimes, you know, Muslims, we get crazy. We should only be talking about Muhammad. Y'all be talking about Christ. Do you know that the companion of the prophet, Umar, thought somebody was Masi El Dijal, translated from the Arabic, that means the Antichrist. And when they went to Prophet Muhammad for permission to kill this man that they thought was Masi El Dijal, the prophet said, peace be upon him, if this man is the Dajjal, then you have nothing to do with him. That is for Jesus, the son of Mariam. Right. Just think, well, just follow me for a minute. See, we talk all this Islamic stuff, but the history sitting right there if we study it. And and they say, well, why is he called the Antichrist? He's anti-Messiah because he will deceive the whole world using Christ. That's the way to get everybody. You can't deceive the whole world using Muhammad. Because people are already been set up mentally to reject Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said when he first heard there was a Muhammad teaching Islam, he thought it was a heathen religion. Because that's the way we had been brought up here. So you can't deceive nobody using the name Muhammad, but you can deceive just about everybody using the name Jesus. The Christ. So he's called Masi El Dijal. And Wednesday night I'm going to talk about how and why he has to be defeated with arguments. Yes, because in a world of materialism, we don't believe that our enemies can be defeated with the word. Everything that you see of the nation of Islam now and the way we are seen all around the world it didn't come because we built this or that. It came because of the word. We're where we are right now because of the word of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the best vessel you can find, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. That's, that's the only thing that's got us here. His enemies didn't come out because we built a bank. We don't have a bank. They're the international bankers. They got the money, they got the guns. Farrakhan has no gun and what money we have, we try to do the best we can with our little nation that's coming up. It's the word that has brought them out. 
So we have to talk about that because when you're struck by materialism, you think nothing's happening unless you got a lot of material stuff. And what he does is he makes you to think that it's the acquisition of material things that gives you your power. That's how he quiets the city. It's a sedative. If I can let you just get enough, you know what? You ain't got enough money for um, Gucci's and Poochie's and stuff. You don't have enough. So let me give you Macy's. Oh, you don't have enough money for Macy. Let's take it down to Walmart. And now some of us, we don't have enough money for Walmart. They don't come up with the dollar store. The concept is, if you can go out and look at something on the shelf and said, I want that. And they said, well, it costs this. And you look and you got enough to get it. When you are able to purchase that thing, the concept is that's to make you feel a sense of empowerment. See, they just quiet the masses down with that. That's why on, I'm going to get you sucker. They said, man, we're going over to get the brothers. And when they got over there, they didn't see nobody. <laughs> they said, man was there by himself, right? Yep. Where the brothers? Man, we went down, we went to take it to the man. And the, and the man was hiring that day. <laughs> see, the brothers are in need. And so when they looked around and his children ran out, turned out he had a white woman. And so, so the whole black movement just went down. See, they want to keep us down. So I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to leave it here. You know, I want to see all the believers briefly just before we leave. So um, inshallah, if you come out Wednesday night, we're going to finish this up because we've got to talk about why the word is so important. Because if we lose sight of that in the nation, they're going to make us so anxious that you're going to run away from the word trying to build according to the word. We don't try that already. You know, and um, we can't afford. We, the full armor is not to condition us for other things. If you can hold on to the word, whatever we build, you'll be able to hold on to it. But we lost everything because we couldn't hold on to the word. Um, it's, it's already written in the scriptures. It would happen. It just can't happen again. Thank you for listening. I salam alaikum. Thank you. Thank you. All praise is due to Allah. So, you know, before we close out, I just need to see the believers for about five, ten minutes. Uh, before we go, and uh, but I thank you all for being out. I thank the MGT again for the great work yesterday. I wish we could have set up even better for our sisters, but um, delicious meals, delicious meals, and this is just a sign of what's to come. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, thank you. All praise is due to Allah. Let's give him another round of applause. Our Delaware Valley Student Regional Minister, Rodney Muhammad. Praise belongs to Allah. Dear family, um, as our brother was teaching and that word was coming from this rostrum, let me ask you this question. Something stimulated something in your mind. It touched you in a certain way. How many believe that what they heard today is true and is good for all of our people and fallen humanity? Just by show of hands. If you believe that. Well, how many are out for their first time? If you believe that, how many are out for their first time today? Just have never been here before. Maybe a second time. Brother right here, thank you for raising your hand, dear brother. Anyone, our sister over here, praise be to Allah. Let me ask you this question. So who invited you out there, sister? Oh, Brother Rodney? Okay, we'll give him a round of applause. Oh, praise you. Who invited you, brother? Brother Elijah X? All right, Brother Elijah, praise be to Allah. Anyway, Oh, has it? Well, brother, I know you're looking at the screen. Uh, just raise your hand. You can get your name up to me and we'll announce it. But brother Anaz, thank you for bringing out a guest today. Praise be to Allah. Give him a round of applause. So my final question is that if you believe that what you heard today 
is true and good for our people, and you would like to, I can't, I can't say come join. You're already a member. Your name just isn't officially in the book. But if you would like to come and help with this project, this work, it's magnanimous if that's such a word. It's a big word. But we need people with big hearts and the courage to go out and do what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is showing us that we can do. So if you feel like that you are able to do that, I would like on behalf of our student regional managers just to shake your hand and say, come on, and we can put you in a process where you can learn more about what you just heard today. Maybe you are suited to be up here doing what you just saw our student regional ministers done. Anyone? Our brother? Sir? Ma'am? If not, you believe so? Well, let me shake your hand anyway. I, I just want to shake your hand. Come on up, brother. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. What's your name, beloved? Deshaun. Deshaun? Yes, sir. Brother Deshaun, thank you for having the courage to come forward, brother. And uh, listen, have a seat with Brother David. He'll talk to you about some things right now. And if you have any other questions after that, if I can help, I don't mind talking to you as well, dear brother. All right. Thank you, dear brother, for coming forward. Praise be to Allah. So, dear family, our time has been well spent, and um, I'm going to make this happen by the grace of Allah very quickly. Um, we're going to move right to our charity portion of our meeting. You know, we have to do what we have to do to keep the lights on. And I see our, <laughs> I see the, the righteous banker all the way in the back, our student <laughs> regional uh, secretary, Lance. I'm going to make this happen. I, I know the look when I see it. <laughs> I got I to gotta make it happen. So, by the grace of Allah, just... That was, a, that was a righteous shout out to my brother because he's a hard worker as well. He's always there and his books have never, our books have never been tainted with him on the post by the grace of Allah. All praise is due to Allah. So dear family, with that being said, if you have $100, $50, you know, if you got $1,000 and you want to help with the work, please do so. And the thing about this work, every time you give to help, the ministry of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, which is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. God don't lie. Allah don't lie. He says, if you help my man, I will help you tenfold. That's right. I didn't say it. I'm just repeating it. Yes. So we got something over here, Brother Nas. Brother Divine, $100. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> Praise be to Allah. Anyone else who would like to do some righteous competition, $100 match on either side. We're not biased, male, female, brother, sister. If you have it at this time, please let us know that you have it. Any $50 donators, $150 on the table. I'm going to come to your number in a minute. I see hands going. I see movement in the audience. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Praise be to Allah. No, we, there's no number too small. There is no number. It's the, it's the desire and the heart to want to give. Yes, sir. So thank you again for giving. How much? Brother James, $50. Thank you, Brother James. Praise be to Allah. Give him a round of applause. Anyone else? $150 at this time. If not, we're going to move very quickly. Are there any $20 donators today? $20. Brother Vincent raises his hand. $20 coming from Brother Vincent. I see Brother Lance. His hand is up in the back. Brother Charles gives $25. Give him a round of applause. Yes, ma'am. Sister Mary, $20. Thank you, Sister Mary. Brother Nas, I saw your hand go up. Brother? Oh, Brother Michael Z, $20. Thank you, Brother Michael. Praise be to Allah. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Brother Shahid? Brother Shahid, Brother Zebulon, $20 each. All praise is due to Allah. Go ahead, soldier. You got a 20? Get his name, Brother. Brother Anonymous, $25. All praise is due to Allah. Get our brother right here. What does he have here? Brother. Brother Robert, on post, $20. Brother, Brother Kenny, $20. We know EFOI. Come on, Brother Kenny. We'll see you in the class tomorrow night by the grace of Allah. Yes, sir. <laughs> Praise be joy. Any other $20? Yes, sir, Brother Nod. Brother Ant, $20. Thank you, Brother Ant. Give him a round of applause. Praise be to Allah. Anyone else? $20. $20 is on the table. Any other $20 donators? I said, somebody said right here. Who said that? Was that for the donation? Okay, we're going to move on. $10, any $10 donators at the time? $10 donators. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, dear family. Well, at this time, let us pass the receptacle. And if you have 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, or just a good spirit, just touch the bucket by the grace of Allah. And then 
due time, if you continue to come out and hear the life-giving teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Allah will allow you at, in his own time to be able to give whatever it is that your heart so desires. Just continue to hear the teachings and we will elevate and be evolved into whatever it is that we want to do by Allah's grace and permission. So dear family, as the receptacles are leaving the floor, let me thank, thank everyone who gave today. Thank you for the least to the greatest amount that was given for you gave in charity when you walked through the door today. You didn't know it, but you already gave in charity because you gave of your time. Time that you could have spent anywhere and time that you can't get back. But since you can't get it back, we just want you to know you didn't waste it because you're, gonna, you're leaving, with, leaving with something today that you didn't walk in the door with. And that is an understanding about something that's going on in the world and even with you that you didn't know before you came in. So it was reciprocal. You gave your time, we gave you the truth by the grace of Allah. So dear family, with that being said, if there are no other, and there's no food or anything today, right? Oh, there's food down. Well, there are some food edibles downstairs. I don't have a list of what it is, but engage yourself and meet somebody, shake hands, hug somebody downstairs. And then, you know, we call it congregating. You know, just meet, talk to the brothers and sisters that you don't know. Introduce yourself. It's all good. That's what's going to happen downstairs. And there are some food items at the table, secretary's table downstairs. So again, dear family, thank you all for being here. And don't forget this paper, the final call. Take one with you today. I know there are some downstairs. Take one home. And even if you don't read it right away, put it on the table. And if there are other members in your house, somebody's going to open it up. And they're going to see something they had never seen before. All praise is due to a lot. So with that being said, if all hearts and minds are at ease, let us close with prayer. In the manner in which you are most comfortable, follow along silently. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful, the one God to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the world, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful, Master of the Day of Judgment in which we now live. Thee alone do we serve and thee alone do we beseech for aid. O Allah, guide us on the straight path, the path of those upon whom thou hast bestowed favors and not the path of those upon whom thy wrath is brought down and nor of those who go astray after hearing thy teaching. Say he Allah is one, Allah is he upon whom we all depend. He neither beget nor is he begotten, and there is none like him. I bear witness that none deserves to be served or worshipped besides Allah, who appears to us in the person of Master W. Farad Muhammad, who are eternally grateful to him for his wise choice in the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And to the two of them, if we lived a thousand years, we can never thank them enough for the man that they shaped with their mind, those two minds and their hands together and gave to us as a gift in the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. It's in their names we pray, I mean. Dear family, our meeting is dismissed, and as we always say at the closing, go in peace. We are never to be the aggressor, but if we are aggressed upon, we fight with those who fight with us. Assalamu alaikum.